Hello there, welcome all to our podcast. I'm Wojk Michnia, based in Beijing, and I'm joined today and in the future by Brandon from Fuzhou. How are you doing, Brandon? Everything is good over here, Wojk. I hope everything is uh, not too cold in Beijing right now. Things, things are going smoothly here. So this is our first episode, our pilot episode of our new podcast together. A recurring podcast. We will call it a wall of ideas. A W O I, episode one. <laughs> Are we ready, Brandon? Are we ready on this end? We plan to get together and have a chat, the way we used to have chats when we lived together in Beijing, when we lived in the same building. And I think it is a good time in 2022 to start again our. Good conversations, and to share with the world, you know, our thoughts, and if we can help people here and there, why not? Yeah, sounds good to me. I hope we can get start something pretty good. Seems like twenty two is going to be that year. I know, and since it's the beginning of the year, many people are like making big goals and planning the year ahead, and they have a list of twenty five hundred things that they're going to do this year, and. I think many are planning or thinking of learning a new language, maybe as a goal for 2022. So, in this first episode, we want to talk about the most effective way to learn a foreign language, and we're gonna say in 2022 because we've just started the year. Both of us have a lot of experience teaching a foreign language, teaching in a foreign language. We've both. Worked abroad for a long time. Now we're based in China, and I think we have a few good tips to share. What do you think, Brandon? I think we have more than a few good tips, especially living in China, for sure. All right. So I like to start with this anecdote. Obviously, I'm Romanian. I learned English in Romania, <laughs> and one of my professors in college, his name is、uh, was Sever Trifu. He passed away. He was also the co-author of one of the、uh, Romanian English dictionaries in our, you know, in Romania. He、oh, told,、wow. uh, I know,、uh, he told us that there are three ways you can learn a language, and he was a cheeky one, right? He was not, he was not afraid to be a bit controversial. So his three ways of learning a language, a foreign language, were: you can learn in a bottle, the bottle being the classroom. With a teacher, you can learn in the country where that language is spoken, either as a native language or as you know the de facto language. For example,、yeah. let's say like you learn English in India, you would have the opportunity to speak English in India. So you learn in in a in the country in a country where the language is spoken. Or number three, or and this is where he was a bit cheeky. He said you learn it in bed, as in you learn it. From someone who is your partner, so you have a、okay. partner who speaks the language either fluently or even better as their native tongue, and then there is a desire to learn. There's a desire. I like that. There's a de- desire to learn <laughs> that language because you want to communicate with with your partner. So in the bottle, in the country, or in bed. How is that for a starter?、Oh, wow. <laughs> That's definitely a good starter, and probably a lot of people's motivation, especially that third one. Yeah, how did you really start?、Uh, what do you think is like the best way, and personally, to learn a language? Actually, the way I started, I still think it's one of the best way, one of the best ways to learn a language. I've had a tutor. I had had a tutor for like almost my entire high school life. I had a private tutor、oh, wow. who used to come to my house every weekend. And we would study for an hour and a half, two hours. We would study English. So I still think, even now in 2022, in the age of like internet and online communication and all the apps and all the tricks that you can use to learn a new language, I still think that having a tutor teach you the language in a methodical way is still a very valuable way of starting to learn a language. And now I know not everyone can find, let's say, a Japanese teacher in 
I don't know, Bulgaria or Romania or Hungary. Yeah. Right? Or it's just expensive or something like that. Or it's very expensive. But deep down, I still believe, obviously, we are both teachers, so we know what we're talking about. Yeah. Deep down, I still think that you can learn a, a foreign language in a very effective way with a tutor. Let me bounce it off to you. What do you think? I mean, I think for sure it's probably like the most ideal way. Like, yeah, if I have that one-on-one, -on -one, it's probably the easiest or most effective. But for me personally, I guess given more real life situations, I probably found if I go back to <laughs> what your professor said, the bottle method, learning Chinese, at least for me, the two or three biggest times I've made my biggest jumps have been just that traditional in the classroom setting. So I used to teach at university when I first, first came to China and I used to let uh, all the teachers take the Chinese classes that the international students would take. So maybe a few hours a week, I could take all the intensive Chinese classes. And that's probably when, when I made, at least noticed my biggest jump is when I had that structure that in the classroom, face to face, like with the teacher. And before then, you know, I would study the book textbooks, maybe an uh, app or two, but that's really when I made, a, I guess, a big significant jump uh, and what I could understand, what I could read. But I also think it depends not only just how you learn. So maybe tutor would be the best way, but it's also how much time you have. For example, like I had less work hours when I was teaching at university, so I had enough time to take these classes. I know a lot of people, maybe they're working 30, 40 hours a week. Going to a class is not going to be the best way off for them. So maybe having a tutor that could come once a week and fit around their schedule would be a much better option or even you know maybe later on we'll talk about some apps and books and stuff like that that they could use true true i can totally connect with what you're saying and yes in both our cases i see that the tutor would come to my house and your chinese classes were happening at your location where we were yeah, working the, so there was no yeah. travel time involved and i think that's a big time saver and yes to Allocate time to learn a new language is one thing, but to also allocate travel time to get to the place where you learn a new language, again, exactly. is um, is like a totally different topic, basically. And I mean, some uh, and some of our viewers or listeners may have different backgrounds or maybe have a different amount of money to spend. I know, probably out of all these methods, the tutor is the most variable. It could be a good amount of money or it could be super expensive depending on how many hours you book them, what country you're booking them in, what language you're trying to learn. Certain languages may be not as expensive to learn depending on the type of teachers you're getting. I know if you're in China, when a native speaker, that teachers come from all halfway across the world just to teach English. So they're going to cost more. And if you want that one-on-one, -on -one, it's going to be even more than that. So depending on how much money you spend could also affect what would be the best way for you to, to learn a language as well. And I think that's, that's a good point and it's a good way to segue into the second method that I think one could learn a foreign <laughs> language and that is in a country, yeah. ba basically being on the street and interacting on the street with the so-called natives, with the people who speak the language and to interact in such a way that is valuable and has like real life implications. For example, I know very fancy word in Chinese, but I can't say how much, is, <laughs> how much is this, right? So yeah. <clears throat> actually this is how I learned Thai when I, I, I lived in Thailand for 16 years. And in my first two years, I didn't even try to learn the language, but I wanted to communicate with people and to like f get a better, a better deal on, on something that I wanted to buy. So I yeah, learned, sure. I learned by practicing the language in the streets and trying to communicate with people. And that was valuable in its, in its, in its way. But the problem was that I learned the colloquial Thai. I learned the everyday language and not necessarily the, um, like the, the standard, the standard, the formal way, especially yeah. the, the polite way of, you know, addressing someone and in Thailand there's a lot of seniority so there are different ways to address someone who's older than you or younger than you 
I, I had no clue of these like nuances of the language. Yeah. But I still believe that like learning on the streets, being in the country where the language you want to learn is spoken is again like a super valuable way to learn a foreign language. And just uh, to piggyback off of what you were saying, I think it's super good way if you're able to get to the country. Uh, like me and you, of course, we've had the opportunity to travel to all these places, to live in different countries. And we've had a chance to actually live and not just visit and be able to interact with people on a daily basis. So that, you know, that immersion method is what even a lot of teachers try to recreate in their classrooms. Like, for example, when I was first learning German, the teacher at a point would only speak to us in German. So she wanted to kind of recreate what it would be like if we were in Germany and we're only hearing German everywhere we go. I think that's one of the, maybe one of the reasons that, that, that immersion kind of led to me being able to, uh, to pick up the language a lot quicker. Also, I did get a chance to, to study in Germany uh, for a year or so. So actually, like you said, being on the ground, hearing how people actually talk versus just what you're reading in textbooks allows you to have more, I guess, make more useful improvements in your language. Because if I could just speak how they do in a textbook, it's cool. Maybe I'll pass an exam. But I won't actually, you know, now I'm in a situation where, oh, I need to go to the store or I need to get toilet paper because it ran out. Uh, how, do I, how do I ask somebody for toilet paper? That's like a real, you know, a real use of language. And being able to be in that situation, you have to talk to somebody or you won't, I won't get to use the bathroom. <laughs> uh, it's just, you know, it's, it's a real situation. And I kinda, it kind of forces you to, to have that, uh, that exchange of language. True, and I was always annoyed when I had to teach English and I, f I was using, the school was using these TOEFL books or ESL books oh, yeah. where you had like topic conversation at the hotel. And I, I always thought like I would never go in a hotel in the lobby and say the things that were in that never textbook. Never been that situation. <laughs> like that's like so ideal to have an answer prepared for a specific Everything. reply from like uh, the receptionist but it's still good, yeah. good practice <laughs> and you know you're not in the country so you're preparing for something that is i think it's it's it's, it's a valid point but yeah there's no way there's no better way than being out there on the street to to learn the language and, and i think i uh, just like to go off what you're saying yeah it's good practice but you know there's some countries especially at least in my experience in china uh, you could know what to say in a situation and you could say it or at least think you're saying it and the person you're talking to is still like oh what are you talking about uh so even if you're textbook savvy being able to actually talk to people on a day-to-day -day basis is more than just like what you study in a book and there's like, many situations i've been in and i thought i was saying the right thing and then they, you know somebody looks at me crazy there's no way <laughs> i could say hello in chinese i could say ni hao and they're like oh what is this guy talking about? Yeah, we, uh, we never say sure. we never say that. Like, what are you talking about? Yeah, we never say that. Yeah, we never say hello. Who is this guy? <laughs> Trying to practice that day to day interaction is definitely uh, something. Although it takes more, you got to be able to put yourself out there for sure. True. But if if you're forced to because you have to survive, then I guess you know that's how you know you can make those strides and improvement. I know, but you know, until now we've we've given the people two ideas that actually are very difficult to implement. One, you need a lot of time and money. Second yeah. one, you need a lot of time and money and to travel in a world where and like yeah, exactly. Germany yeah, is in lockdown right now. If you're not like going, yeah. you're not, you can't go to Europe. So obviously we're talking here about an ideal world, but let's, let's dig in and let's, let's come up with some more practical ideas. And I think another way that I learned English and Italian uh, to a very good level was by watching movies. And by watching movies with subtitles in my native language, right, in Romanian. So I was listening to the, the people interact in the movie, whatever, and, I, and whenever I didn't understand or I yeah. was not, it was not clear by reading the subs, you were actually accumulating vocabulary, you were understanding from the context to, so learning by watching movies, uh, shows, I think it's also an amazing um, way to learn a new language, a foreign language. For me, 
it's one of those ways that I know for sure it works, but it doesn't work for me. Like I, I come from uh, my hometown is like a huge uh, Hispanic population, so a lot of them told me they learned English by just like watching the cartoons that we watched at the time. So maybe they watch Dragon Ball Z, but it has like the you know the voice acted in English and all this stuff. Um, but for me, when I'm trying to learn a language, usually, and I've watched, I watch, you know, we watch a lot of, it's 2021, we watch so many shows on Netflix, maybe they have the Spanish subtitles, maybe they have the Chinese subtitles. It's hard for me to kind of passively pick it up, pick up a language. Uh, and I know it does 100%, it's a great way to learn, but just in my experience, I, I, I watch a whole bunch of anime, which is subtitled, in, you know, spoken in Japanese, subtitled in English. I can't and- speak... <laughs> at all you, you, you're still not fluent in Japanese nah I'm gonna say I think I can say hello can you watch but that's about it <laughs> I haven't picked up and I've watched it for years haven't picked up any Japanese and maybe it's because mostly I'm just reading the subtitles I'm just reading English even mm. though, even though you know there's no English voices I'm listening to or anything uh, so I think for some people yeah it's great for others maybe like me the passive picking it up it just doesn't work. Conversely, when I was learning German, a lot of the movies <laughs> did not have subtitles. Uh, maybe we just had a strict teacher. I don't know. Taskmaster. But most of the movies he showed us, no subtitles, all German. Most of it we didn't understand at first. But I, I remember those movies now a lot more. <laughs> a, lot, a lot more. I could still, like one of the movies we watched was called Run, Lola, Run. And I was in German. <laughs> we watched a movie called their vice of rose the white rose <laughs> like i remember all these movies even though none of it was in english so i think for, at least for me movies that don't have the english subtitles and maybe or both maybe you have the english and then the language you're learning that kind of made a bigger uh difference for me and i think it's an important point to make here that not every idea that we might give out today will work for everyone yeah. and that uh, specific circumstances maybe learning styles or your interaction with the medium is different and you might absorb the language in a different way or you're faster at learning the language on the street or with a teacher than by watching a show. But the sad thing now in my country is that all cartoons are dubbed. So, and it's like, it's the most horrible dubbing ever. And they're trying to put on the, the voices and the sound effects and I could watch like like four minutes and I was like, this is insane. Like we were not helping these kids <laughs> learn the language by just spoon feeding them what the characters are saying. So what's your take on that? Uh, dubbed or no dubbed? Uh, it depends. Like, I know in America, like maybe late 90s, early 2000s, we used to get a lot of like Japanese stuff dubbed in English and it was terrible. Like the old Godzilla movies, you would see the lips moving like this, but the English was coming out crazy. And it's kind of a thing. Like, we love those movies, and we always replicate. But no, yeah, the dubs were terrible back then. Nowadays, mm, I don't know. I feel like they, at least in in America, so anything coming to America, they kind of got the dubs a little better. Although, usually, I still watch stuff in, like, the, the original language. Like, so, I know Squid Games was super popular. Like a couple months ago, when it came out on Netflix, How did I didn't you watch even it? know that there were. I watched it in Korean, but I didn't know there was a, a dub. I I never clicked the turn the English. I didn't even know it was a thing. So I mean, it was cool, but just like I said before, all I'm doing is just you know reading them subtitles like the whole time. I, but I hear I hear people that watch the dub. It was a, a different experience. <laughs> so I don't know. But also with the rise of like streaming services, Netflix and whatnot. Yeah. And. and foreign film companies coming up with movies for a, for an international audience they do the dubbing by themselves and they bring in the uh, the actors the voice actors and sometimes they use local talent so there is a bit of an accent in it mm-hmm. so then it's more it's it's a more genuine experience than just like a random as you said a random person giving the Godzilla dubbing in like English yeah. when, when the guy has finished speaking I- <laughs> The English version is still on. All right. I think we cannot avoid mentioning the fact that you can also still learn a foreign language with a pen, paper, and a textbook. 
yeah. I remain a bookish person as as you can see behind me and you know I read a lot or I used to read oh, a yeah. lot before my nine months old son was born and <laughs> even when I was practicing Chinese I had my textbook opened and I was writing and I was reading I was trying to decipher the text more than just audio or watching a video so I think yeah. it's still a valuable experience to learn through a textbook now I'll get your feedback on this and maybe we can discuss what's a good textbook I guess I would say it depends what language you're learning like some it will definitely benefit you to have that textbook and like and I'll go back to Chinese for example um, when we're learning Chinese there's a lot you have to remember the characters there's a lot of memorization and language that has a lot of things you need to memorize having that textbook having them flashcards being able to practice the writing the characters like physically is an important aspect of it. So one of the first things they're going to give you, if you take a class, you'll get a huge empty notebook just to practice writing characters. And I, I know, especially for you, do, doing your calligraphy, uh, <laughs> you, can, you can practice writing characters forever and still not get it right. So yeah, I, I have to say that <laughs> that uh, some, for some, some aspects, we just do need that, uh, or would it behoove you to use that paper and pencil old school technique or an iPad if you have it. This is probably an app that you can do the character true, as well. True, true. So let's go back to my question. What is a good textbook? So I have to admit that I come from a more traditional background and I learned English by doing like endless grammar exercises by filling in the blanks with like the past tense or verb three. Yeah. <laughs> and it worked for me and I liked it and I loved it. but. I don't think that those were good textbooks. And I also don't think that the, the textbooks that sometimes are being used in, a, in ESL language classes where you have the fake conversation between you yeah. and a driver, it's, it's also not very <laughs> realistic. So let's bounce off some ideas. What is a good foreign language textbook? It doesn't have to be English. I mean, I guess it depends on the language. But let's say, okay, let's say for English, what would be a good language, a good textbook for English? I guess for a good textbook, it kind of has to make you, well, it has to put you in a situation that would actually occur when you're uh, practicing a language. The, you know, a lot of times you do get the, like you said, like situations that just probably don't happen. You're not going to be a situation where you're like, oh, hello. And the person says, oh, good day. Like nobody talks like that. <laughs> and you're not going to get that response from somebody. So a situation, a uh, textbook that actually puts you in real life situations, also one that kind of makes it makes you want to practice. Like some some textbooks really are fill in the blanks, and eventually, you know, you're gonna get bored of just filling in blind grammar exercises. So something that makes you, I guess, a little, at least a little bit excited to keep on going, pushing through, just like a, any good book, page turner. You, <laughs> if a textbook was a page turner as well, that'd be kind of cool, maybe. <laughs> kind of add some interesting uh you know you got interesting storylines so there's a lot of stuff you can do with a textbook and you can kind of not just you know even if it's just pen and paper maybe evolve it uh it's 2021 turn it into an audio book maybe have an english podcast as a textbook there's different ways and different mediums to say what you want to say and to keep listeners engaged especially just like we're doing now, there's probably going to be some people that maybe English is in their first language and they're listening to our podcast to practice, see how people mm. actually speak. And as long as we keep in, are keeping them engaged, keeping them coming back, I think it's a much better way than the traditional route because they're actually excited to learn. Most progress, you know, people studying and found out, people that want to learn the language and are excited about learning the language make the most progress in actually doing it. So keeping, uh, you know, keeping your user, your reader, engaged and excited about learning it's probably a huge thing to do for sure yeah I, I i totally agree and i don't think i'll have anything to add to that perfect textbook uh example what i have <laughs> to say is that when i did my hsk1 test and i was pl preparing for Oof. the uh, for the chinese exam by the way i i, I passed hsk1 now i'm hsk none because i haven't oh. touched a book in like, <laughs> in like nine months but <laughs> some some of the words there are, were, are just were just like unreal 
And I would never see myself in a situation where I would have to say those things. But then again, I understand it's it's a different kind of language where you have to learn characters yeah. and whatnot. And sometimes the character, the easier character was for like a word that maybe was not that important. So let's wrap it up today. In this podcast, we mentioned you could learn a foreign language with a tutor in a classroom on the street from movies from good textbooks but let's not ignore you know the dinosaur in the room the internet yeah apps <laughs> podcasts as you mentioned youtube actually i think youtube for me has become like the greatest classroom oh, so far youtube youtube university the <laughs> greatest classroom of all i think sure. so right so if if people are planning to learn a language in 2022, I think there are plenty of resources out there. Even if we mention any apps, it would just not make sense to mention because we can't mention them all. And there are so many great apps there. Some of them are very specific for languages. But if you if you just search in your app, app store or in Google Play or whatever platform you use yeah. for your language, you would get tons and tons many free some there's a there's a premium to pay but i think there are opportunities to learn a new language everywhere and i agree with you there's definitely <laughs> plenty of opportunities uh the more opportunities than ever and i guess we're just trying to get people a little more focused uh because there's so much information available mm -hmm. that they have so hopefully they've been able to you know at least focus themselves a little more and try try one of the ways to see if it applies to you and if it doesn't, try a different way. There's so many methods out here to, to learn a new language. And it's, it's the perfect or one of the best skills you can get uh, going forward uh, into our new year. And I'd like to end this, this first amazing podcast, video podcast that we've had today <laughs> and go back to what my professor said, last idea he had, you can learn a foreign language in bed. And I guess what he wanted to say, if there's a motivation and a drive to learn the language. You could learn a foreign language in any other way. And I think throughout yeah. this podcast, you, do, you did mention the fact that depending on your motivation and on your time and on the reasons why you want to learn a language, you could potentially be very successful in a shorter amount of time than, you know, someone else who's just fooling around or, <laughs> or someone else who's Someone else who's put in a classroom and told you have to learn this language. You have to learn it. And yeah. you have an exam coming up, so better learn it. All right. That was an amazing chat. Any parting comments? Oh, uh, I guess, again, for going into 22, uh, my, my biggest parting comment, at least for this first podcast, would be uh, if you're trying to learn a language, try to find something that does motivate you. Try to find, find that why, that reason. Uh, and it could be anything. It could be you want to travel, you want to change things up. Again, it's a new year. A lot of people want to switch stuff up in their life. And if that's something you want to do, that could be your motivation. But just try to find a little, give, give yourself a why. And that will definitely help you and allow you to power through and be able to, to master something. New. I love it. I love it. And I think there's a why to our podcast too. We want to stay together. We want to continue great conversations. We want to share our ideas. Yeah. And I think in this world of the internet and the lockdown and all the madness that's happening, that's, uh, keeping connections. It's important. I invite everyone to return next week for the second episode of A Wall of Ideas, AWOI, episode two. Until then, this is Voiko signing off from Beijing and Brandon from Fujo. Everyone, take care. Bye.